All right, this week we're starting something new. I don't know if it's called Coach the Pros or How the Pros Ski, but we're gonna be looking at the best skiers in the world from the best events in the world, and we're gonna break down their skiing, both good and bad. So let me know in the comments if you wanna see more of this. Also, if you're listening on the podcast, um, you may want to tune into the YouTube version because uh, I'm gonna be sharing the screen and we're gonna be looking at Rob Skiing from the Malibu Open last year um, in the finals. Also, I do wanna say a big thank you to TWBC, Vince and Tony and the rest of the guys over there. They are doing a phenomenal job and I'm gonna make use of the TWBC's uh, broadcast to be able to show what some of the best skiers in the world do and why they are the best skiers in the world. So I'm gonna hit play here just so you can watch. This is 38 off. And I want to see if you can pick up anything, um, both good and bad. And again, 38 off, <clears throat> I have this plane at uh, half speed, I believe. And that's just because Roberto uh, does so much good stuff that I want you guys to be able to see it. Um, but I want to see if you can pick out maybe an error that he's making that might be something that can catch up to him at the later passes. So again, 38 off and not a bad pass at all for Rob. All right, now that we watch 38, let's watch 39 as well, just so we can kind of try to correlate what we saw at 38 maybe to 39. And again, I want you to watch closely and see what you can see that maybe Rob could do a little bit better. Remembering this is one of the premier events and it's do or die. The pressure's high, so cut him some slack, but let's check it out. 39, pulling out for the gates, Roberto. Again, a lot of stuff he does well, but I wanna see if you can find something that may be a big error that's starting to show up even more here at 39. You see, just a power skier, um, no matter what, he can still get through that pass. So <clears throat> I'm gonna back it up now, and I'm gonna kinda of show you what I'm seeing and what he and I have talked about in the past. And also, I'm gonna show you, well, he's already, a, he's already focused, he's already been working on this, by the way. So, not to, to cut him down, but he's already addressing this, and I think it's already better going into the season. He's been skiing through the winter off and on. So, again, not a bad one, a little loose line, but you see he gets his acceleration going here before Whitewater, so it's plenty of time to get space before two, especially at 39 for Rob. But one thing to note, because he felt a little late on the acceleration, meaning he was just a little bit like loose out of one here, we see him load maybe a little harder than he would like. He may not say that, but because of that, watch what happens through this exit trough. See that? Where the femurs, and we're not going to get deep tonight, but we're just going to talk about a few things. Where the femurs get almost 90 degrees, to the water to his shin or almost parallel to the water if you see yourself or other skiers get stuck in this chair position through that transition often that means there was a lot of load leading up to that transition that you couldn't manage so you have to absorb it here otherwise you will explode and the ski will shoot out towards the shore um, but the result of that is your center mass gets stuck behind your feet so if we drop a straight line down from the center mass that means the center mass is, here, let me get more centered. It's behind his, his, his back foot, really. So that means he's now in a decelerating position. And you say, okay, well, he's transitioning into two. He should be decelerating. Yeah, 39 and a half off, things are scary. But the problem is, if you decelerate too quickly, you end up taking a straight path at the ball. Um, and you end up losing line tension. And we'll see here in a sec what happens to Rob going into two. And he's still hanging on with two hands, but you can see he's starting, just by the way he's shifting the handle, he's starting to transition more of the load to this arm right here, to that trailing arm. And because of that, you see him come off the handle a little sooner than I'd like, okay? And as he comes off the handle, we know he just left a bunch of swing on the table, meaning he could have got more swing out of the situation and, and higher on the buoy earlier, but... As soon as he lets go, watch the spray off the ski. Right now, the spray off of his ski is, let's see if I can get a good color, is behind his body. The spray's coming off nice and nice and 
uh, flat off the ski. As soon as he lets go, watch the spray. Do you see that? Suddenly you, the spray is coming off much steeper and you can actually see the effect of the spray. The ski now just set an edge. Now at 39, I'm getting very nitpicky because he's one of the best in the world. I can do that without hurting his feelings. Um, but this applies even at 32 miles an hour, 15 off. This idea of not necessarily giving up to the boat or um, releasing the pressure off of that lead arm so soon. And I'm gonna have a couple caveats at the end of this, so make sure you stick around because I'm gonna talk about a few amateur skiers and uh, a, a few rules that apply to what I just said. Let's back it up a bit. He gets compressed, so the ski is quite a bit out in front of him. It's very hard now to climb back up over the ski. In other words, for him to get a center mass from here all the way over to here, so to speak, to kind of, for him to make this move up there in the amount of time he has left before it's time to actually execute the buoy before he gets to apex, um, it, it's a, a slim chance. So he's got to deal with this now, the situation of kind of allowing that ski to get too far in front of him. Um, but he does it beautifully. But you'll notice he, as soon as he lets go here, that spray comes off the ski. You see that just for a second right there. And as that spray comes off the ski, that's when his line goes from more outbound to now more straight at the ball. That's when that, that's the moment that it happens. But then he has to flatten out, watch the spray. You can tell a lot from spray. So now he, he set that edge a little too hard and he's got to trim the ski out or get it off of an angle, off of a roll angle so he can still keep going outbound. And because of that, you see that spray is behind, hidden behind his body again but it's less than ideal because that initial edge that he set by kind of coming off the handle back a little bit and coming off the handle too early has now set him up for a straight path at the ball. He's managing it, but you'll notice he's squeezing for the extra width. Can you see him just stretching? That arm goes high, that, that reaching arm, that off arm, and he starts to fall in right here because the line's loose, all right? Now, he can manage that, but a lot of us skiers, a lot of us amateur skiers cannot. And let me back this up and play this half speed just so you can kind of see now that we've talked about it um, from buoy one, okay? And this is more, more than anything, I'm just trying to kind of pull the curtain back on how I view skiers and how I kind of one way I will assess a skier pro or amateur um, and some of the tools I use to assess that. So let's go half speed just so you can kind of see a little bit better. Little loose line, digs a little extra hard, gets bounced there, gets pulled inside, loose line, has to manage it. You see how fast all that happened. That was really fast and that was half speed. Let me back it up just for the heck of it while you're still here listening, hopefully. And let's, let's watch this whole thing at full speed just so you can see how insane it is what these guys do and what you do as an amateur because even at 32 miles an hour, 15 off, Things are happening fast. You know that. I don't have to tell you that. Watch this, real time. See if you can pick out what happened, what we talked about. It was subtle, right? It was subtle, but I'm gonna let him finish this pass out because I wanna get to 41. And now you can start to see some things that we talked about, hopefully, previous to that. And let's get to 41 because this very same thing catches up to him. So here we have 41, and notice how, I'm gonna play at full speed, how the very same thing ends up happening to Rob. It just shows itself even more at such a short rope. It happens even into one. And you see he's really narrow too, tries to stretch, catches the rope on the tip of the ski, and he's bummed, but hey, he's in the finals of the Malibu, so no big deal, right? Um, so a couple things. Let's just take this uh, with a grain of salt. I'm gonna go half speed. Now watch what happens here. Again, Rob's one of the best in the world at his alignment and his stance on the acceleration phase. That's where you generate a lot of angle by generating speed, right? And then that's where you generate that swing up on the boat, whether you're 15 off, 32 miles an hour, or 39 or 41 off. But notice how he's a little compressed. Notice how he's in a bit of a squat with his hips. And that gets his center of mass just a little bit back. So you see his center of mass is a little bit further back than it would be if he was more extended. Think about this, right? Standing just a little bit taller, coming into that uh, weight crossing and trying to not buckle under the load would get his shoulders a little higher 
and his head a little more balanced over his feet. And just that little extra shift in mass by staying taller and driving towards the tip of your ski, towards the first wake, can make a huge difference in outcome. Just wanted to point that out. That, that was a total aside, by the way. So notice though, because of that compression he got, watch how much he gets compressed here at, at the second wake, at the exit trough rather. Because of that, he gets pulled inside, has to let go. Notice how early he lets go. And now he's on a straight path to the buoy. He miraculously gets around it and he does some Houdini trick where he doesn't fall, right? Now, he's actually not a bad spot in my opinion. But again, he comes off the handle a little too soon here. See that? And as soon as that happens, he loses just a little extra swing. One of the things you can notice about your skiing or anybody you're watching, if you have the ability to watch it back, as soon as uh, the handle is, the, the second hand comes off the handle, the line usually goes somewhat slack right there. If you back it up just before the hand comes off the handle, you notice that the line is pretty tight. And that'll hold true for most skiers, all right? So as soon as the hand comes off the handle, the line goes a little loose, and that means you lose your connection with the boat. And as a result, you see right here, he is on a straight path to two, barely gets around it, body slams, and actually, I feel like he might have hung on to that, but he caught the ski on the tip of the rope, or the tip of the ski on the rope. So that's all she wrote. Now, let's go back to 39. I want to show you one thing that's interesting to cap this off before we go back to a couple amateurs to kind of wrap up this concept. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I want to see, this is 39 and a half off, Rob going from uh, one to two. I'm going to, to count the time in, you know, hundreds of a second from this second whitewater until he lets go into two into four and into six and i want you to notice something that's very interesting about the differences between those three buoys so we're going to put the clock here his boots are right at the edge of that whitewater we're going to see how long it takes for him to let go with that outside hand into two all right right probably right there the next frame the hands off, 0.316, remember that number. All right, this is into buoy four. From the edge of that white water until the time he lets the hand off, hands coming off right there. So I'm gonna say roughly 0.35, right? 0.35 to 0.36, so a little longer than into two. All right, this is into buoy number six, but before I advance it, I just want you to take a note that Rob's not as compressed as he was in the buoy two or four. We all do something different in the six. That's kind of what I wanted to get at, but let's just take note of when he actually lets go. And right there, you see his hand comes off. So 0.4 seconds, right? Previous one was 0.36, the other one was 0.31-ish. So he's hanging on longest into buoy number six. Now, I don't wanna to get too much in the weeds, but what that tells me is what he's doing into buoy six is not freaking out about being able to make a turn without slack. He's not worried about being able to get to buoy seven. So the anxiety is lower into buoy six. And because of that, he does a couple things different. He doesn't load quite as hard into the wakes. He loads a little longer with his body away, but because of that, he's able to stay more over the top of his ski. If we go back, so the weight crossing into four, and you see how compressed he gets right there, right? This is from three to four. Much more load in the system through his feet and through the rope, we can tell because he's getting compressed. And because of that, he gets pulled out the back. Now, into six, again, to review, He's a little taller. He's not loaded quite as much, especially through center line. He's already coming off load. And because of that, notice how much more over his feet he is and less compressed. Mass is almost right over the middle of his feet, right here in the six. And we know because we did the, the clockwork, he holds on longer in the six because of it. So those are some, some takeaways, I think, from Rob, even in a high pressure situation, we know this is one of his weaknesses. He's got sometimes a tough time coming out of 2-4 very cleanly. And I think this is one of the things 
that he, he could work on, he already is working on, just as a side note, but it's something that a lot of us could work on. Oftentimes it's finding the things that we do well or where we do the things that we wanna do, where we already do them well. Sometimes people pull out for the gates, phenomenal, with alignment, with stance, and then once they get in the course, that same cut to the left, they squat, they sit back. So just be on the lookout for these things because these little moments in your own skiing or other people's skiing can be very powerful in being able to not hack the system, but take something you may already be doing really well in another area, maybe outside the course, and be able to bring that into your skiing in the course. So before I wrap this up, let's go show a different perspective of the same thing and talk about those few caveats about just simply trying to hang on with two hands longer. So here we've got my good friend, Dan LeFevre, great skier, been doing it for decades, um, into 39 and a half off. And I want to point out kind of a, a, the good version of this management of not only driving into the wakes, but also managing that outbound swing. Uh, so let's watch Dan here as he moves into the wakes. Um, he wasn't skiing very good if you asked him here this set here at the, at the ridge a couple years ago, but I think he was skiing plenty good. So you notice that as Dan comes outbound, he's still hanging on with two hands and he hangs on almost until he sets that new edge. And that's quite, quite a good uh, effort into his offside turn. Now, what I want to show is the same thing that we just talked about. Um, where he lets go of two hands, I want us to, to look at the drone view to see if we can notice any, any kind of inconsistency or kink in the skier path. Zoom in on the drone view and now watch his path. Same path, same exact pass. And there's very little, if any, kink right when he lets go on his path. His path is pretty continuous there. I, I think you would agree. Now, let's zoom out so we can see both at the same time. And let's just watch him Turn two here, not a bad two. I think this is 32 off maybe. Driving into the wakes, great drive. And we see him transition. He stays quite tall. He's got both hands on the handle. He's controlled and he's balanced with the load through his arms, right? He's not too heavy on one arm or the other. He hangs on, keeps the handle close. And then as he lets go, he lets go only when he sets that new edge and his body has rolled to that new roll angle, the pre-turn roll angle, then he lets go. And again, notice how his skier path, there's really no kink or, or you can't really tell when he lets go, to be honest. Maybe just a little bit, but it's very hard to see any kind of inconsistency, again, in his path into the ball. It's pretty continuous line. Now I'm not gonna pick on her, but I've got another skier here, Miss Yenna Grubbs, and we're gonna talk about the same thing. So let's watch, let's watch Yenna here. Um, I believe this is 22 off, so the wake sucks. And you'll see her get kicked a little bit, and you'll see her start to get pulled in, and this happens to a lot of us. So you see the shoulder, she's getting pulled kind of over the top and to the inside because uh, she got kicked out the back through the wakes, right? And this happens to a lot of us right there. She kind of got kicked, bucked, and now she's on this weird path where she wants her ski to keep going out, but her body's getting pulled in. So she's at odds. And because of that, she has to let go right here a little early, okay? And if we zoom up to, the, to, her, to her path into the buoy, you can almost see a little bit of a kink right where she went to let go here and then there. That's a little exaggerated, but I want to show you into buoy three because I think it's a little bit more apparent. Again, phenomenal skier. I just want to point this out, the difference. As soon as you see her let go here, let's go up to the drone view because this is the exact same pass. Let's see if we can see a kink. And remember what I told you about Rob. As soon as he lets go at 39 into two, he loses that line or connection with the boat. And the only thing keeping his ski from shooting to the shore is setting the edge. And that's evident by spray coming off the ski at a higher rate. All right. Watch Yenna's uh, skier path. As soon as she lets go, she just lets go right here and notice her ski path. See how it gets wider. So you've got an inner ski path and you've got this outer ski path right there. And for a moment in this, through this phase right here, 
it gets wider, that's because the ski goes from tracking to smearing or skidding, okay? I know I'm getting the weeds, I'm sorry. I, I love this stuff. So it's hard to keep it short and sweet. But my point with all that is if you watch Yenna, you can correlate directly. Right when she lets go of the handle, not only does the rope go slack as soon as she lets go, see it's tight here, as soon as she lets go, it goes slack. You see that? But also, as soon as she lets go, that's where you see her ski go from tracking to smearing right there. And if I just go back and forth a couple times, you'll see that. Let's go ski smears. We often prepare, we jump to the inside, we wanna slow down, we wanna to prepare to turn. And by letting go with that offhand, we lose the line tension and we set that hard edge on the ski. And you see that ski immediately go from this kind of outbound trajectory to suddenly right here, it's now on this down course trajectory. And I really just wanted to show you two perspectives of the same exact pass, what it looks like from the boat here. And of course she's got loose line the whole way into the buoy because of it, but she knows how to manage it. But also what that same thing from the boat view looks like from the drone view. Now, there's one thing that you must do. This is my buddy, Jeremy. Jeremy's a great skier. Um, this was early in the season, so he wasn't skiing his best. But I want to point out, sometimes you lose direction not by giving up to the boat and letting go of two hands like, like Rob or like Yenna here, but you lose direction much before that. You lose direction by kind of overloading here and getting stuck in the back of the, of the, on, the, on the back of the ski and then having to give it up through the wakes, right? So what do you imagine that path is gonna look like? Because I have Jeremy's path too. Let's go back and look at that. Instead of the kink in his path being when he lets go with, with two hand or with one hand, the kink in his path actually looks more like it's happening right there, right here behind the boat. That's where he suddenly changes directions and you can kind of see that where he was motoring along, motoring along, and then bam, he just ends up getting pulled more towards the buoy right through the wakes. And that's one of the things that it's kind of a prerequisite for dealing with what I've been talking about this whole uh, podcast, that kind of idea of trying to stay strong with your lead arm going outbound, that back arm, some people call it, going outbound and not letting go with two hands until you figure out how to set that new edge and find even stance through your feet. But you can't even worry about that if you end up overloading going into the wakes and you can't hold that load that you've created through center line. And this is at 30 miles an hour, 15 off, or 41 off, 36 miles an hour. So the key is, Obviously, we want to maintain our swing outbound, right? We want to maintain our connection to the boat as far outbound as we can. That's where two hands hanging on, keeping your body close to the handle, not getting pulled into the back seat can really help. But one of the prerequisites for that is you have to make sure that you're building progressive load by having the right stance, right? Stance is everything. How you stand on that ski as you drive into the wakes is everything. If we go back and we look at Rob here at 38 off, you'll just notice that one of the things that he does better than most is he's just got this stance on the ski. Shoulders, hips in alignment, driving forward towards the tip of the ski. That should be what you aspire to if you're a entry level or mid-level amateur skier. Um, obviously that is the most important fundamental of it all. So we talk about a lot FPM, but obviously if you're doing that well and you're maintaining that load through the wakes, then the next thing that you have to think about is what are you doing from center line outbound? Because that this zone over here is where most people are giving up most of what they generate into the wakes. Most people are giving up 80% of what they build when they move outbound. And this is one of those fundamentals. It's glad I could share uh, one of my buddies uh, sets here from a great tournament. And yeah, let me know if you like this. Um, I would love to do more. Let me know what pro you would like to be coached next. And maybe we'll keep this thing going. So thank you guys for joining. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and subscribe anywhere you get your podcast. Just search FPM podcast. And please don't hold this against Rob. He's one of the best in the world. 
but I just had to kind of break it down for you because it's fun. And if you like it, we'll do more. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm.